Well, good morning, church. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And indeed, the Lord is very present in this place this morning as we prepare to worship him in the beauty and the glory of this sanctuary. And on this beautiful day, I do feel that fall is here, but I may be tempting fate, right? Um, it is wonderful to see you this morning and to welcome you to worship. I'm Susie Thomas, our lead pastor here at Farmville United Methodist Church, and our deacon and minister of youth, the Reverend Lindsay Blakely in the middle bank right there, will be assisting me uh, at the service of Holy Communion, and she's also serving as our online host this morning. So, Congregation of the Air, those watching over the internet this morning, welcome to you. And uh, if you will say good morning in the comments, Reverend Lindsay will welcome you with a hearty greeting. So today is Communion Sunday. We'll gather at the Lord's table, and it is a table that is open to all, regardless of age or race or really anything at all. Christ welcomes us to his table, and he nourishes us uh, there. A special welcome this morning to any visitors we have with us, especially Hamden, Sydney, and Longwood students. Um, you'll see at the back of the sanctuary, there's a little dish back there that has some of these pink, bright pink cards. Can't miss them. These are connection cards, and they're really for our visitors. If you would share your contact information with us, um, we'll, be, we'll take good care of it, and uh, you'll hear back from us. On the rear of the cards is a place for your prayer requests, congregation, so be sure to share your prayer requests with us that way as well. Well, I am really excited this morning in that today is the beginning of our five sermon series on the stained glass windows of our church. We're calling it Stories in Stained Glass, and they all do tell the wonderful stories of scripture, and they speak to us eloquently today. Each Sunday uh, of this series will feature an original organ composition by our amazing organist, Dr. Gordon Ring, um, the unsung hero of our worship services, if I may say that. With the, highlighted worship, with the highlighted window as its subject. And today's window is the resurrection window over here to my left and to your right, the He is Risen window. So uh, the, the uh, offertory will be the original piece that Gordon has composed in honor of the window of the day, so to speak. And the middle hymn, the sermon, and that offertory will all speak together about the topic, which is today our resurrection window. Um, I'd like to invite Daphne Mason forward. Daphne is our communion steward, and she will say a few words to us um, about a, a project that she undertook uh, that is really very special. So Daphne, the microphone is right there for you. Good morning. I invite you to look around your sanctuary. Are we not blessed to have the most gorgeous windows in the world? These windows have been researched through the years for their history, for their generosity of the givers, for their artistic beauty. And many years ago in our church, there was a lady, a lovely lady, Grace Jefferson, whose heartfelt desire was to put together a pamphlet with all of that history and all of that information so that everyone in our church could have a copy of it. There was only one thing missing for Grace, and she felt that each one should have its scriptural re reference with the information, the history, and so on. She asked me if I would help her with this project, and of course, I was thrilled to death to be asked. We didn't get very far before her health failed, and she died 11 years ago. Shortly after her death, her husband Brantley, whom most of us knew as Jeff, called me and asked me if I would finish the project. No holes barred. Again, I was quite thrilled. A little stymied, but thrilled. I worked with a professional photographer and Grace's notes, and the first edition of this pamphlet came to fruition. Now, through the years, our supply of the first one has diminished, and on the suggestion of Joe Smith, Bob and I were thrilled to join with her to have a second printing done with an additional dedication, that to Jeff, who died last year. Now, Susie will tell you more about this edition in just a minute. But I would like to say that I think that our lives these days are tumultuous. 
And I would like to sort of paraphrase our Lord and say, come into this sanctuary, all ye who are heavy laden, bring your pamphlet, and you can find peace. Thank you so much, Daphne. You played such an important role in bringing this booklet to fruition, not once but twice. And there are copies for everyone here and everyone who would like one to come on future Sundays. In the back of the sanctuary, the ushers will show you where the baskets are. Please be sure to take one home with you and to read it and enjoy it. Well, just a few more announcements this morning for the good of the order. Next Sunday is our fall kickoff. And that means that um, some of the familiar things that you've probably been missing during this long COVID winter of ours will be back, namely our acolytes, our bulletin, and in some form or fashion, our chancel choir. So <laughs> very excited about that. In addition, the adult Sunday school classes will begin meeting again under this roof, and our children's Sunday school will meet again in the newly refurbished, new, freshly painted children's classrooms on the second floor. So it should be a very exciting Sunday next Sunday, and you're invited to join us not at 10, but at 9, right here in the sanctuary. Those who are interested in learning more about Christian education and Sunday school will have sort of a little Sunday school rally right here before the classes go off to their individual classrooms to meet. So that's 9 o'clock next Sunday morning. And then finally, um, as Daphne alluded to, there is just so much on our minds and on our hearts these days, so many natural and human-caused disasters. Um, but right now, we are collecting for two of those disasters. First is the COVID disaster. Uh, down in the church office there, across from the office, there is a big bin that says boxes of blessings. And we are collecting healthy snacks for our uh, healthcare workers at the Central Hospital. So whatever healthy means to you, nuts or raisins or mints or uh, fruit juice, um, just bring it in, put it in the bin, and every day we deliver uh, to the hospital. And, and thank you. And additionally, uh, we are also collecting for our United Methodist Committee on Relief, which has been on the ground in southeast Louisiana before the hurricane struck and will stay until well after um, the disaster has been cleaned up, and that means years. So you're invited to, if you um, feel so led, to make a contribution to UMCOR, and 100% of everything you give will go to direct relief. If you would make your check out to uh, Farmville United Methodist Church, and in the memo line, just put Hurricane or Ida or UMCOR, it'll get to where it needs to go. And thank you. So now that was a lot said. Let us uh, take a deep breath, and in silence, let us center our hearts for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us take that deep and cleansing breath now. Breathing in the deep peace of Christ. So come now and let us worship God together. Martha? Faith. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. When the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Would you stand now as we sing together our opening hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. The words will be in front of you on your screens. except for the children. Will the children come forward now and join Miss Susan here on the steps? Good morning. morning. Y'all, I am so excited today because starting today, Reverend Susie, for the next several Sundays, is going to choose one of our beautiful windows to speak to us about in her message. And I don't know about y'all, but the very first time that Mr. Kimbrough and I visited our church, the first thing we noticed were the beautiful windows. We don't really know just a whole lot about the windows. We don't know who designed them, and we really don't even know who made them. We don't even have any pictures of what the church looks like before the windows were put in. But we do know that the first ones were installed in 1908. That's over 100 years ago. And the last one was installed in 1964, which is still a very long time ago. I was only eight years old then. <laughs> Reverend Susie let me borrow this beautiful stained glass cross. And if you look closely at it, you can see that the artist has taken glass, a sheet of glass, and cut it and then to, to make the design and then took metal and bonded it or soldered it together to make this beautiful piece. Now this is a small stained glass. Our windows are really big. Now we're gonna take a little field trip just on this side of the sanctuary and we're gonna just take a closer look because sometimes we walk in and we see things and then we really don't pay that close of attention to them so will y'all walk with me over here? We'll start right here and we'll go real fast. So this very first stained glass is a story of when Jesus blessed the children. And you can see each one of the pieces of glass was cut individually. And then the next one, this is what Reverend Susie's going to talk about today is the story of when Jesus went up into heaven 
after he came back to life, after he had been crucified. And this next one is the story of when Jesus' friends went and visited him after he died. And when they got there, they found out what had happened. The tomb was what? Empty, it sure was. And this next one is the story about Jesus and his mother, Mary. And the last one on this side is when Jesus was healing all of the sick people that came to him. Sometimes all they had to do was touch the robe of his, touch his robe and they would be healed. Now let's walk all the way around back this way. We'll go up the center aisle and sit back down. This way. <laughs> We're playing follow the leader. So now we know that every single one of these pictures actually tells a story in the Bible. When I was in the fifth grade, my parents gave me this book. You can tell how old it is because look at the, how yellow the pages are. But one of my favorite things to do was to read stories out of this book because sometimes when you read the real Bible, it's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? But if you have a storybook Bible and you ask your parents to read it to you, then it helps you to feel closer to God and to Jesus. So if you have one, ask your parents to do that for you, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the artist that made the beautiful stained glass windows in our church that tell us the stories of the Bible. Amen. And now for the prayer for illumination. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that our hearts and minds may be open to know your truth and your way. Amen. The scripture reading today, if you would please stand, is from Matthew. Chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven had come and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Martha. Now, would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I cannot think of a better passage from scripture or a more glorious window to start off our Stories in Stained Glass series than this window right over here, the resurrection window, also called the He is Risen window, 
It's uh, to my left and to your right, of course, and we will have it before you on the screen. In a, do we have it in a, a close-up version up there, tech guys? There we go, okay. Um, the detail is maybe hard to see, but uh, might be better than craning your neck a little bit. But before you leave today, do be sure to, as the children just did with uh, Miss Susan, to really uh, come and look at it up close and personal. It uh, rewards your time. Well, the window, of course, depicts the story of the women coming to Jesus' tomb on Easter morning, as Martha read to us from the Gospel of Matthew. And the four Gospels, of course, tell the stories of Jesus and the resurrection story in their own way. Some feature three women, some two. The number of angels varies. Matthew has an earthquake. John has Jesus himself appearing to Mary Magdalene. So there are differences among the four Gospels. But I think they can be accounted for um, by the fact that we have four different people or communities doing the telling. And by the pa passage of time that separated Jesus' life from the telling of these stories originally and the, the writing down of these stories, it's kind of like a, a game of telephone, you know, where what comes out at the end isn't necessarily what went in at the beginning. But our highlighted window shows something that's common to all four Gospels. Early on Easter morning, those who came to mourn or to anoint Jesus' body with spices found that his tomb was empty. The women didn't discover Jesus' absence by themselves in our windows telling and in the scripture. They had the help of this radiant angel who gestures with his right hand and says, I know you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he was raised as he said. The angel and his, or her, we really don't know, news seems to have startled two of the women. As you can see, one of them has sort of drawn back and has her hand on the chest of, of her neighbor, and the other one uh, is kneeling on the ground on one knee with one hand shielding her face and the other hand on the jar of ointment that she had brought to anoint Jesus' body. The third woman, so who is that in the deep blue robe? Any guesses out there? Mary, yes, yes, that is most likely Mary, the mother of Jesus. Unlike the other two women, she doesn't look at the angel uh, or at the empty tomb, but instead she's clasping her hands, isn't she, at, at her chest, and she's looking down as though deep in prayer. And I think she's giving thanks to God that what her son had been saying all along about his mission has turned out to be true, that he would die on a cross, and after three days, he would be raised again. <laughs> if you look at the upper left-hand part of the window, underneath of this kind of classical uh, pillar structure that surrounds this window and its companion window, Jesus in the garden over here, if you look at that, that little piece of yellow-greenish area up there in the left-hand corner, you will see three crosses uh, outlined against a distant sky. And that is a visual reminder to us who look at this window, that the glory of the empty tomb did not come cheaply. Jesus suffered a terrible death, abandoned by his disciples and betrayed by his closest friend. He died and was wrapped in grave clothes, which lie on the side of the stone tomb there. You see them? Cast aside as though in triumph when he rose. <laughs> and alongside the white grave clothes, you can see the crown of thorns there on the side of the tomb that was pressed down on Jesus' brow by the Roman soldiers who crucified him. That is some artistic license, though, on the part of the window's maker, because the crown of thorns isn't mentioned in any of the gospel accounts of resurrection morning. <laughs> so let's look now for a moment at the colors of this window. Each color has significance in telling the story. The makers of stained glass windows have been using color as a, a sort of vocabulary for a very long time. Mary is robed in that beautiful deep blue, and that's sort of her trademark color. It's a symbol of her innocence and her purity. The angel's clothing and wings, of course, are beautiful, dazzling, brilliant white, uh, the color of purity. And alongside the women there, in their reddish uh, robes, are bushes and clumps of green vegetation, and green is, is uh, the symbol of new life, and especially new life in Christ. So this window, as you will read when you pick up one of the, the uh, stories in stained glass booklets on your way out, this window along with four others 
three others, I think, no, four others, five altogether, I think, were installed in 1908, as Susan said, when this sanctuary was consecrated to the glory of God. And at the service of consecration on May the 8th, 1908, the Farmville Herald wrote that the church was, quote, the handsomest church in the state, complete in every respect. <laughs> The pride of the congregation must have been on display along with those five beautiful windows <laughs> that morning. I'd like to tell you now just a little bit about the, win the person in whose memory the window was given. If you look at the bottom of the window, underneath of the head of the cherub and his outstretched wings, you see a, a panel there, and if you can't read those words, this is what they say. To the glory of God and in memory of Charles McKinney Walker by his wife. So I'm grateful to Scott Harwood, Jr. of our church for providing me with some background on Charles and his wife, Ella. Ella Eugenia Warren and Charles were married in 1870, and Charles was a veteran of the Civil War, as were many in that day, and a businessman in Farmville, evidently a, quite a successful one. He owned a, a number of dry goods stores here in town along with other enterprises. Charles and Ella were among the leading citizens of Farmville in their day, and they were very active in this congregation. Charles died in 1905 at age 60, and his wife glorified God and memorialized her husband with the gift of this magnificent window. In addition to the windows in the back of the church dedicated to her parents, Halla Edmonds Warren and Mahala Booth Warren, and you can have a look at those two on your way out. So we have in our congregation today some descendants of Charles and Ella Walker, and they tend to sit, for obvious reasons, underneath of their window <laughs> over here, uh, Scott Harwood and his son, Scott Jr., who is with us today, along with his wife and Eric. And uh, the connection is that Charles McKinney Walker and his wife, Ella, are Scott Sr. and his sister Susan's great-grandparents. So Scott and Elizabeth, they would be your great great Great? Three greats? Two greats. Two greats. Grandparents, okay. <laughs> On his mother's side. So there you have a bit of family history and a living connection to the donor of three of our windows. You know, I think that as Southerners, um, many of us feel the weight of the past particularly keenly. It seems true to me what William Faulkner wrote, that the past is never dead, it's not even past. And as Christians, those words should resonate deeply with us. Our faith is a living faith, after all. And through telling and retelling our sacred stories, we feel a tangible connection with the storyteller, capital S. The biblical past isn't dead, for sure. It's alive and kicking right here among us. These windows bring the stories to life for all who see them. This created beauty reminds us of God Almighty, who is uncreated beauty itself. And by the luminous light of these panels, we come just a step closer in our spirits to the one who is the light of the world. St. Augustine, a great doctor of the church from the third century after Christ, called God beauty ever ancient, ever new. One writer put it this way, if Augustine is right that God is beauty, then a church without beauty would be as absurd as a church that rejected truth or goodness. A full-fledged rejection or disregard of beauty would literally be rejecting and disregarding God. So beautiful things in both the natural and the human-made world help us by pointing us toward the true divine beauty. I believe that's true. These beautiful windows and others like them around the world and down the centuries are silent sermons that speak not with words, but with pattern and color and light. I'm a person who makes my living through the use of words, but I am very content to sit here as often as I can in silence and just listen to what the stories in stained glass have to tell me. So I invite each of you to spend some time in the silence, silent presence of beauty, whether here or wherever you find it, just to rest and renew your parched and tired souls in this uniquely trying time. May God give to each of us the opportunity to look through this glass and in the words of the angel in our scripture, to come and see and then go and tell others about the love of the one who lived and died and rose again for our sakes. Amen.
So what better hymn to follow a message on the resurrection window than Easter people raise your voices. <laughs> That's what we will stand as we sing as we stand together and sing. <laughs> Now, before you take your seats again, I invite you to turn and greet one another and pass the peace of Christ. Hello, up there. There we go. Some very good mingling taking place out there. One of these days soon we'll have our, our uh, coffee fellowship time back, and then we'll really be able to mingle, plus donuts and coffee, right? So, um, so in the prayers or in the concerns and prayers of our church this morning, um, I want to note that our altar flowers, which are especially beautiful, I think, today, were given in memory of Mrs. Eileen McClary by her daughter, Margaret Agee. And our welcome team this morning are Jim and Susan Kimbrough, and our liturgist is Martha Butler. So in our prayers of intercession this morning, I, we come before the Lord, uh, I know I speak for many of us, all of us, with concern for all who are struggling with the resurgent COVID-19 virus. Those who are in the hospital, those who are sick at home, those recovering, and those who are mourning a loss in its aftermath. And pray especially for the many young children and their parents uh, who have contracted the virus, um, for their teachers, and uh, for all who care for our children. May the weeks ahead bring healing and hope as we work and as we pray for the end of COVID-19. And we give thanks for the many health care workers who sacrifice so much to care for the ill. We thank God as well for the life-saving vaccines uh, that are available to us now. I will lift these individual petitions before the people of God, and after each one, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. Lord, for those who suffer from the effects of natural disasters, war, or violence, and for those who come to their aid, Lord, in your mercy, for the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, Lord, in your mercy, for the aged and the infirm, for the widowed and for the orphans, for the sick and the suffering, Lord, in your mercy, for the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captive, and for all who remember and care for them, 
Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the departed, Lord, in your mercy. And now as one people, we pray the prayer our Savior taught us, praying together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, our closing hymn, the prelude to Holy Communion, is sent forth by God's blessing. So let us stand now and we'll sing together. may be seated. Well, you know, I'm keeping you on your toes. You may think that I'd forgotten the offering, but no. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Lindsay, for reminding me <laughs> about the offering. I know the Finance Committee would have had something to say if we left it out. So now it is time to uh, give to God back just a portion of what he has so graciously shared with us. I invite the ushers to come forward as we take up this morning's offering.
Let us pray. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Well, we come now to the table of the Lord, and as we begin the prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving, we ask that you take your communion elements in your hand, the little chalice and uh, wafer, um, but don't remove the covering on the juice quite yet. We'll give you plenty of time to open your communion elements and to receive. So we come to this table, the table of the Lord, recognizing our need for divine grace. In humility, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we do not want to be challenged by the cross. We set our minds on human things. We long for the security from our possessions. We prefer our own comfort. Forgive us, we pray. May our sense of self-preservation be disturbed by your son's example, that we might take up his cross in service to the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. The Mighty One has sent his deliverance for all people, even the generations yet unborn. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to his Father in heaven for it, he broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to his friends, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you gather in my name, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Because there is one loaf, we, though many, are one in this one Lord. The cup over which we give thanks is the sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice what is called an open table. We believe that this table belongs to Christ and Christ alone. And no matter who you are, you are invited to come and meet him here in this holy meal. So come to the table. You who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who depend on this sacrament and you for whom it is brand new. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed, come, Christ meets us here. The feast is ready. We invite you now to remove the covering from your communion elements. body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to stand for our benediction. Friends, now Jesus calls us to go and tell of God's great love and grace. Go now to love and serve the Lord in all you do. Amen. <laughs>